Yep. But coming up in the next couple of minutes is Jem Yoshioka, who is an amazing webcomic artist who uh, started, well, actually, she's been drawing comics oh, for at know. least a decade yeah. yep. and had a massive hit on Webtoons on their Canvas um, program called Circuits and Veins, which is a beautiful story set um, in a in a in a not too distant future, and it is really inclusive of gender and sexuality. It's inclusive of different types of bodies and how they work, and is a sci-fi romance, beautiful thing. It's beautifully drawn as well. Yes. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to asking Gem questions about her watercolor technique, and she is also a bit of a superstar and a pioneer. I mean, she, Gem was creating things in webtoons way at the inception of it and uh, later on we've got her in the panel and she talks about the development of that and like how comics and graphic work is like a, a kind of cutting edge a pioneering place to be in arts world absolutely and she's award-winning as well she she won best comic at chromacon for two years in a row i yes. think and is just a beautiful storyteller and often talks about um diaspora and her identity as a um, new zealand japanese person and she is going to talk to us about putting together a web comic what are the tips and tricks you know webtoons is, has become this incredible platform for showing amazing artists but it's also requiring you to do you know six or seven pages mm. a week and that's a lot of content and especially if you 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 know you want to do other things like have friends or maybe even work a job or anything else so Jem's going to join us very very shortly and will talk us through her tips and techniques around how she goes about putting together a web comic and making it efficient and easy to do and well maybe not easy to do but <laughs> easier easier the other thing is well I think Jim will talk us through is like the difference between doing it on a digital platform and on paper, because there's certain things about the, the kind of scroll aspect of it, or the kind of semi animated we talked to when we were uh, kind of programming this about if you can make things recede or scroll down. And those are obviously different from if you're doing it in a printed form or just drawing it live. So I think it's going to be fabulous. And if you've got any questions at all, this is the time to send them in to us because Jim is the person who can answer them. That's right. So again, you go to slido.com and then you enter the code ComicFestNZ and then you can um, have it up there. Have we have we got a gem? We've got a gem. Hello, gem. Hi. Hopefully you can hear me okay. We can. Awesome. Welcome right. to the Comic Fest stream. Um, we will hand it over to you and you get to go live and take over the stream for as long as you want and we'll pop up a little bit later with some questions and things but over to you awesome thank you sam thanks neil um happy to happy to be here uh so um i'm going to be giving you a little bit of a rundown um about i guess a few more technical things about how it is that you can go about updating a comic every week uh, without burning out. So um, web comics are obviously a really great and easy way to get a handle on um, publishing, especially without needing to go through like any of the formal processes or um, or problems that come with um, that come with trying to get your work into a printed format. Uh, but there is um, kind of an expectation from audiences to publish um, at quite a high rate. And so I've done that for uh, quite a number of years now. And so I have some tips as to how you can achieve that without burning out. So um, I'm presenting inside of my iPad uh, using Clip Studio Paint. So this is actually the program that I use to make comics every single week uh, on the iPad as well. So yeah. Comics, we love to make, some, make them, but also they are a very a time consuming. Uh, however, to make a story for an online audience, uh, regular updates are important. Um, so what do you do? The answer is you optimize. 
So you work out what things you need to do in order to meet your deadline um, typo. Um, this can be a trial and error, but also heaps of artists share time-saving tips online, like I'm about to do, there's me. Some of these tips can be used by any software um, or actually a, a sort of completely software agnostic, like they're just a different way for you to think about uh, what it is that you're doing. Uh, but some of them will be specific to Clip Studio Paint. Um, I'll let you know um, if there is one that I think is a Clip Studio exclusive, although there could still be um, others that I don't know about. Um, let's see. So first, you need to work out the phases of your update. So what is it that you actually need to do to get a finished product that's going to be out ready in a week? Um, I usually publish to a webtoon format, so that means that I'm aiming for usually around 40 panels per update. Um, and so then I need to think about what it is that's going to go into each of those. So usually for me, it's something like writing, thumbnailing and storyboarding, sketching, inking, colouring, bubbling and lettering, and getting the background sorted. Um, not necessarily in this order. Um, so then you need to think about what it is the minimum standard that you're willing to accept is complete. And this is quite important because um, as a creator, I think it's very much um, within our nature to want things to be perfect. But actually, that's going to work against you as you're trying to work to a, to a really tight deadline, like a weekly, like weekly webcomic. So working on comics in general often means compromise. So you can compromise on your detail and quality to finish faster. Uh, or you can compromise on your time to make the high quality work. However, if you work too slowly, it will take you longer to complete. Um, and sometimes that might mean you lose stamina or interest in the project. If you're working to try and make every single panel to the highest possible quality, that is an awful lot of effort and you can lose that sense of like flow and movement and pacing um, in terms of your own personal engagement with the comic, regardless of how it is that you've written about it. Um, and if you work too fast, you might be unhappy with the quality of work you produce. It might be that you um, you don't sort of don't um, really get to the level that you um, that you are wanting within the, um, within the the, the piece. So um, it's the trick is that you need to find a balance. So for me, I always try to make my comics, um, my comic panels at about 60 to 70% of my illustration power. This means that I can work fast, but it also means that I have a minimum level that I'm trying to meet. So setting the bar to about 60 to 70% of what I know that I can achieve with a finished illustration also means that um, when I crank up the effort, like you can really tell. So this is something that is sort of closer to my 100%. Um, and you can see like it, it feels like you know, we're really dynamic and interesting. So I can have these kinds of really high impact panels um, by having the rest of it at a lower level. <laughs> so yeah, pick your hero panels and let the rest of the comic support them. So like other kinds of things um, are potentially like this sort of stuff. So when making regular, um, regular um, updates, people remember the one amazing panel, not the five decent ones. So it's a comic, all of the panels work together. They don't all have to be to the same quality. So um, some tips for writing. So I find when you're writing a, like a long form story in a weekly format, um, what I always like to do is outline my series, my whole series, everything that I'm planning to make into um, bullet points. Um, this means that um, hi, DJ. Um, this means that I have a shape of the whole story before I start. And to me, this is like a really critical point in making sure that I um, have everything in my head at, at least at the start. Um, and, and this is like a document that I will work to and adjust as time goes on. Um, so yeah, I can see three to, um, I then write um, in, in draft form about three to five scripts at a time. Um, but then I will only draw one at a time. So it always means that I've got like a backlog of scripts ready to go. And it also means that I get a good sense of pacing across several updates. So when you're updating weekly, you kind of want to have a think about what your readers are going to be experiencing for like the rest, like the sort of next three to four to five updates. What's coming up for them in a month from now, if you're updating on a weekly schedule. That way you can get a bit of a sense of um, whether or not you're achieving a pacing goal 
for that audience? You know, are, are they still going to be in the same conversation in the same room or have you moved on from that? Um, sometimes updating weekly, the pacing can feel quite different to the end sort of feeling. Um, so it's good to keep in mind. But yeah, I'm always refining as I go. So I will, if I um, sort of open up script three and realize that I made decisions in script one or two that changed some stuff, I'll just change it on the fly. Um, if I open up um, my overall bullet point list and I realize that actually I need to make some changes to where I'm going with the whole story outline because a different feature has been important and different elements really come to, to the front in terms of what, what my readers have latched onto because that's another advantage of publishing regularly. But yeah, I can just make those changes. But yeah, other artists work in all sorts of different formats. So some people write the entire script first before they even um, before they even start a comic page. And some people don't work from an outline and they just work beat by beat per update. Um, this works really well if you're doing like a slice of life format or like a, um, like a um, more sort of like a standard like um, like um, strip style comic. Um, you don't necessarily have to work from a from an overall plan. The important thing is to find a way to write that matches um, and works with the pace that you wish to publish at. So um, I think sometimes as comic artists, like the the creation of the page is um, such a it's so much work to get the drawings down that you kind of forget that writing is something that you've got to factor in time wise as well. Um, so yeah, make sure that whenever you're setting your time frames for how long something's going to take, you have your writing process mapped in alongside that. So for me, it means that every sort of three to five weeks, I need to make sure that I have a little bit time set aside to write my next three to five um, sort of scripts um, so that I've continued to got that um, that within my within my format. Um, so tips for thumbnailing. Um, this is a really important phase within comics because it helps you to outline exactly what's what's coming along. Um, so if you're working alone though, your thumbnails only need to be read by one person and that's you. So you can use whatever shorthand you want to achieve a thumbnail. Like quite often, this might be the level that I draw to. And then something like that is 100% fine for a thumbnail. What you're looking for when you're developing your thumbnails is a sense of pacing and flow. And you can also pick which panels you think you're going to spend the most time on later. Um, I'm working in webtoon scroll formats, but this sort of stuff applies to traditional pages too. Um, with scroll, um, you know, you have the added advantage of not needing to work on layouts as much so you can worry more about each panel and the panels around it having good pacing rather than needing to worry about how the structure of the page is going to fit together um, so yeah there's lots of interesting things you can do with scroll format i could talk about scroll for ages this isn't about scroll so um, this is a little sort of sample of what scroll format can kind of feel like in terms of making sure you're getting your pacing this is the level that a lot of my thumbnails might look um, but before I kind of um, get to the next stage. Uh, so tips for sketching. Uh, don't do it. Um, so I'm actually halfway serious about this. Um, once I get really comfy making weekly updates, I found that sketching actually didn't add much over my thumbnails uh, like 90% of the time. So I actually stopped doing it. Um, and so I now go from thumbnails to inks. So um, my thumbnails have gotten a little bit more detailed, but it does mean that I'm actually skipping a step. It means that there's like, um, I am, when you're, when you're make, working on an update, um, you sort of, you know, you go through the comic and you make it essentially four or five times as you add each of the different steps in. So by removing sketching, I've actually saved myself like a whole pass over the comic. So I now go from thumbnails to inks without really um, feeling like I'm losing every, anything. So this is my um, my thumbnail. This is sort of the first level sketch pass that I will do. And then, then what I will um, will just ink straight from this. And so you can see like the difference. Um, this is like what the finished panel will look like at the end. So um, yeah, so you can see it's sort of, um, I just ink straight from, from that little, from this little sketch. So I don't, um, yeah, I don't sort of muck around with other, with other things. Um, yeah, which is, this works for me is essentially, um, because, you know, as you, as you get to know your characters and you draw them literally hundreds of times, if you're drawing like 40 panels a week, you actually don't need to 
<laughs> you don't need to practice drawing them because you already know. Um, but for complex panels and poses, I still will likely do a sketch. Um, tips for inks. So when working to a, a weekly panel that's really fast, ink, uh, inking takes a lot of time. Um, so actually reuse your inks as much as you can. Um, this is um, actually an advantage because people can see reused assets as creating consistency and will save you time um, for your more important panels. So you can see here, like I've actually reused most of the line work on these two panels. It has a different um, gradient background and I've changed um, the character's expression, but most of the rest of the inks are the same. So I haven't had to draw her hair again, which is quite time consuming. I haven't had to worry about you know, drawing the pose or anything else about her, I can focus on the expression and it makes the drawing feel more consistent because the only thing that's needed to change has been her face. So yeah, um, let's see, tips for coloring. So I find um, with coloring, you've just got to um, establish a good color palette um, and keep it close to hand. So I use Clip Studio Paint, but um, other programs do this as well. Procreate does do this. You can actually develop your own color palettes per program um, and you can have them. So this is for my, my Fog Remedy set, which has been the project that I've been working on the most recently. Um, these different colors um, are grouped to sort of match the different characters. Um, the top one is like my, um, my base sort of lighting and shading colors. Um, and then I also have, um, yeah, just a bunch of different colors that I know that I'm going to be using regularly for different characters. Um, so yeah, you get your color palette, keep it close to hand, you fill your characters in, and then you just keep coloring in until you are finished or you die. Um, this is because like, coloring is like my least <laughs> favorite part because it's very fiddly. Um, you have to color in so many eyeballs. Um, I think anyone that's had to color in a comic and you just get to a certain point where you're like, really? Eyeballs again? That's so rude of you. Um, so, um, there's actually, it, it really grinds me down after a wee while. I usually make sure I've got something entertaining to watch or work on while I'm doing comics. The advantage is that, um, that the coloring phase, because, um, with it being so monotonous, you can very easily do other stuff at the same time. Um, so if you are using Clip Studio Paint though, um, I have found this incredible tool. Um, it is this guy here. Um, so he's like, he's over here in my, um, in my, um, color palette. Um, he has a Japanese name, but it essentially means like, uh, close and fill tool without gaps. Um, and he is my hero. Um, and I love him. So, um, he's a custom fill tool. Um, you can save time, save your life, um, and save your hand as well. So, um, here, yeah, I can just quickly demo how it works. So I've got my um, my base color layer that I've already set up here. Um, I will just lock this layer. And then I pick, like, if I pick a color um, skin tone and I just want to color in her ear, I can um, just loop, uh, do a lasso circle around her ear and it will only color in her ear. It won't color in any other part of her hair. Um, it's pretty sensitive. I mean, you can adjust the sensitivity in terms of whether it will identify gaps or not, which is really useful for me because they have quite a sketchy style. Um, but there's, you know, it's got also, I usually will come in with like a, an, an ink brush to, to block off any like bigger gaps. Um, and then you can just do your loop, um, and it's going to fill in the whole shape. Um, I find this incredibly useful, especially for coloring things like hair, because um, it means that you can have these kinds of like wispy textures and stuff without needing to worry about getting into every area. So for instance, if I was to use a regular color tool, um, regular fill tool, I'm just going to use blue, because blue is a great color for hair. Um, you can see there's all of these gaps that would um, that would be aligned and I'd have to come through here and like tap each of these little strokes in. Whereas if I um, come in with my with my fill tool, I can I usually create like a new layer underneath the one that I've been working on. Um, and I can just um, fill in and it's all filled and it's like that takes me a second as opposed to like 30 seconds. And then I don't have any cleanup that I need to do. If I turn the line art off, you can see that, um, I mean, the, the top layer is a little bit fiddly, but you can see there's like no gaps within the color. If I was doing like a flatting job um, for a print, 
I might come back through here and like clean all of this up. But since we're doing web comics, we don't need to worry about that, which is great. More time saving tips. Um, yeah. So how to do um, bubbles and panel borders. So this is also like something that's a clip studio exclusive, but um, I find this step really annoying just in general, getting the words onto the page can be really frustrating. Um, and so actually the thing that I did to help myself feel better about the process was I moved um, bubbling earlier into the process. So I wasn't doing it right at the end before, um, before I was publishing. Um, and so I didn't feel like it was dragging out my ability to meet my update deadlines. Um, so I use um, Clip Studio Paint Story Editor to manage all of my te um, text. Um, there's two versions of Clip Studio Paint. There's a pro version, which is actually the, um, the entry level version. And then there's EX, which is the one that I do, um, I use. And it's got this great um, extra features around story. So if you click on story in here, you can actually edit all of your text at once. So this is um, usually what I will do when I'm working on my comic, as I can have all of my text available um, and I can just scroll through. This is my whole presentation here in text form and I can change any word in here and it will reflect what it is that I'm doing um, on this, on this um, page. Let's see, here we go. Yeah, so you can go in here, hi. So, um, so yeah, that is um, Clip Studio um, Text Editor Manager. Uh, because it is developed for Japanese text, um, Clip Studio Paint's originally a Japanese program, it doesn't handle things like hyphenation as easily as you might be able to handle it within Photoshop. Um, so you do have to be quite conscious of where your line breaks are within your words, um, which you should be anyway when you're, when you're thinking of comics. Um, but yeah, the other thing that I really like is you can save custom balloon shapes as assets. Um, so the cool thing about that is if I go over to my, um, my asset panel, which is also another great thing that Clip Studio Paint has, um, I have all of these balloon assets. Um, I've downloaded a lot of these from the internet, but you can also make your own. Um, they're a special kind of asset that means that if I drag it over any text, the text is instantly put into the balloon. So I can then come in here and I can readjust the size of this balloon um, and it just will automatically um, automatically kind of adjust any um, any of the, the text will move within the bubble. So I can reshape this to fit whatever it is that I need. I can also, um, it's a vector, so I can very easily like redraw it as well if I wanted to like have it have like, you know, I actually want it to be like a little bit square in this corner for some reason, you can adjust all of that. Um, I have really shaky hands, so it's not always the best for me to do. Um, and then you can add your tail in. There's an easy tail marker. And so this is a completely um, completely vector thing. It's also, um, as you can go in here, you can see it's changed the text layer into a balloon layer. But these are still completely separate from each other. So I can move the text around within the bubble. But the bubble and the text are linked for whatever it is that I need to do. So... A plus, thank you, Clip Studio Paint, for thinking about comic artists because I don't think anyone else does to this level. It's amazing. Um, they also use the panel borders. Um, so this is like another thing that's built into Clip Studio Paint. Um, so you can actually just like draw panels in and it will um, give you like a shape that will mask out the rest of the, um, the, rest of the shape. So um, I, um, you, can, you can sort of... Um, um, I have them set up so that they're all on one mask layer and then you can actually just like, um, you know, I could drag my folder into this and it works very the same as a folder. Now everything that's outside of these is masked um, and you can drag and um, reveal. So it's a really easy way to, um, to handle panel borders. Um, you can also set each of them up as individual folders, um, which means that you can sort of have each panel sit individually and move them around. I find for my weekly comic workflow, I like to have all of my inks, all of my colors, all of my um, backgrounds on the same layer or on the same folders across the whole page. So the fold, the folders aren't that useful to me. But if you're working in a um, on a page format, it might be more useful to be able to move individual panels around in order to make your compositions uh, come together. So again, thanks Clip Studio Paint. Um, great work um let's see all right other advanced tips so i'll delete my 
Um, I'll draw your link in this layer. Um, so save templates of your base file layers. Um, this way you don't have to remake your layers each time. So um, Clip Studio Paint and Photoshop definitely both do this, I believe. Um, if you, you can't find out how to do it, you can actually just save a master file that you can then customize from, which is what I used to do before I knew that these things exist. But I can just come into um, to Clip Studio Paint. I can go to um, my um, Webturn format. I can click um, Folk Remedy, which is like my preset length. It automatically populates with all of this stuff. But then I also have this thing called template here. Um, and I have like a couple that I can choose from. You can choose like any of the default ones. Um, but layer template is my default that sets me up with all of my base layers that I know I'm going to need for a comic. So if I just click OK, it'll then generate this, um, this thing for me. Great thing about Clip Studio Paint EX is it actually also generates all of your pages together. So I usually start with around um, 10 of these big strip canvases um, so that I can view them all together, which is also what I'm doing over here. Um, and then if I tap into one, nice, beautiful, long, empty canvas. But then you can see I have a set of folders that it's automatically populated for me. Um, and this one is set to draft. So this would be where I would usually come in to do, to do my um, thumbnails before I would... Um, before I would sort of do anything else. But it means that I that the step of having to think about where the folders sit, all of that stuff is taken care of. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, there are also actions that you can do. So if you're doing the same kind of thing over and over, um, you can actually save that as an action and come back to that over and over again. But um, I'm not gonna show you how to do that because they're a little bit fiddly. Um, but yeah, you can also save assets. So if you know that you're going to be having the same kind of background every single time, if you know that you're going to be, um, you know, using using the same sorts of things like the bubble assets, you can save them into either, in Clip Studio Paint, you can save them into these special assets folders. But if you're uh, creating in other programs, you can just save them on a page. Um, I know a lot of folks who, who will do that, they will just have like a page that's got all of their sort of like master inks some people will even like draw their characters in like 360 degree views so they don't have to worry about like drawing the back of the character's head over and over. They can just copy and paste it in. Um, so they've got their own asset sheets that they can work from. Very good time saving tip. Um, if you can just copy and paste an asset, that's going to take you like 30 seconds as opposed to having to draw it out, which will take you inevitably longer than it's going to take to paste it in. Um, you can also use 3D. Um, so Clip Studio Paint actually has some 3D functionality, but you can also use programs like SketchUp um, to set up your backgrounds. So I have um, used uh, SketchUp and they have a great 3D model warehouse, um, which you can use to actually create assets. I then have a lot of filters that I run over the top of them and they can feel more sort of um, like a good match to my style. Um, so yeah, that is, um, that is kind of um, some, some tips there. Um, so this is like what a um, this is what a three D file looks like within Clip Studio Paint, um, and then I can I can actually like move out around the um, not the perspective I can move the actual like layer around here so I can change like my camera perspective. Um, so if we've got a bunch of shots that are like two characters talking to each other in the same room, I don't have to draw that from scratch from two perspectives. I can just like move the camera around which can be very useful. Um, so yeah, I, um, I really enjoy having this. This is definitely um, chug -a lugs a little on the iPad, but um, I have the, the fancy one with the, most, um, with the most RAM. So in order to be able to do this like a little bit smoother than I can in other, in other um, programs. Um, you can also use, there's a whole lot of 3D dolls mm -hmm. that you can use to pose and um, copy poses from. There's also an asset store where you can actually like drag and drop poses onto the dolls that have already been created. It is another skill set and all in of its own, but it is um, actually quite a useful way to manage um, if you um, if you're doing especially like difficult um, like um, really dynamic poses and like action and stuff. Um, so yeah, that is um, that is sort of like the most all of that kind of stuff. Um, and now I'm going to do a wee um, drawing demo to kind of show you what it is that I'm working on. But um, I'm happy to take questions 
at the same time if you guys would like to um to send any through while I'm sketching away. Jim, you're a superstar. Thank you so much. This is so incredible. Everyone in the studio is like, what? Oh my God. This is amazing. So thank you so much for that super generous presentation. Um, we have lots of questions coming through. I'll just start with the top of the list. So Ken asks, Ken says, hi, Jim. I'm a big fan of your work, especially Folk Remedy. Are there things that you enjoy doing in your free time and how have you found community during the pandemic? Oh, that's very easy. Um, things I do in my free time, um, I play Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> apart from making comics, uh, which does take up most of my free time because I, um, I do actually have a job in communications that I do outside of comic work. So um, comics doesn't necessarily pay the bills. But um, I have I have stay, stay sustainable work that that fills that need. Um, but yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I'm I have a, a couple of games where I'm a player, and then I'm also running a game as well. So um, I um, and it's it's actually set in Folk Remedy universe, sort of. Um, it's like a, an alternate universe where I've used a bunch of the stuff that I've been using in Folk Remedy. So as I've been um, it's been incredibly fulfilling um, and all of my players are also mixed Japanese like me so I've been able to like lean really hardcore into um, into sort of bringing all of the like Japanese mixed Japanese heritage stuff into what it is that I do with that um, it's been yeah very fun um, we we're actually playing uh, this afternoon <laughs> after I finish up uh, at Comic Fest um, but yeah it's um it's been really good in that regard um, I live alone, so it's just been me and Bijou through a lot of the pandemic, who's my cat. Um, she may wander past at some point, although I think she's asleep up in her cat tree. Um, but I think the, the main thing that's sort of kept me connected has been um, has been both like connecting in with like my, my comics community, so other people who also make web comics. Um, they're actually some of the like kindest and nicest people that I've ever had to like work with. Really generous with their time, really generous with like the skills that they have where they're sharing knowledge, all of that kind of stuff. So it's been a very, um, a very kind of worthwhile experience to have built that up. Um, and then also this, um, like this Nikkei sort of Japanese um, people who are not necessarily directly from Japan um, connecting into each other. So I've had those two communities throughout the pandemic that have really helped to make me feel a little less like I'm sort of a lone pine cone. Yeah. <laughs> And I noticed that you're drawing um, maple here. Can you tell the audience a little bit about Folk Remedy? Is that allowed? Yeah, I can tell you a little bit about Folk Remedy. So um, Folk Remedy is um, the story that I'm working on the most at the moment. It is um, currently not available online. I'm sorry, because I'm actually in the process of pitching it to publishers, uh, which is very exciting. Um, I've met, I got an agent at the end of last year who is helping me to... Um, to um, find a home for Folk Remedy. But um, the story of Folk Remedy is that it follows Maple, who is um, an apothecary student. So she's an apothecary apprentice learning how to make traditional medicine. Um, and there's been a whole lot of changes to the way that, um, that her society, which is like a fantasy Japan set in Taisho era, which is sort of like 1920s-ish, 1910s, 1920s-ish Japan. Um, and during that time, there's been, in, in real life history, there were a lot of changes and laws that were brought in about what kinds of things you could do, especially around um, things that, that were considered to be um, not Western. There was a big Westernization of Japan at that time. Um, there's not really a West in folk remedy because it's a fantasy Japan setting, but there is a lot of pressure to modernize. So, um, so Maple is kind of stuck in this position with this modernization happening around her and her career that she'd trained in her whole life no longer being something she could actually pursue. Um, and at, at this time, this is when she meets um, she meets a yokai. Um, and yokai are um, Japanese um, sort of monsters, I guess is the closest kind of, not really very, closest we've got as a, um, as a sort of parallel in, in um, Western culture. Um, and there's all, there are all sorts of different kinds and the yokai world is also going through this same kind of change because the, it's connected to the human world. Anything that's connected to 
you know, the, yeah, yokai are a response to like a human need. Like we can go on. I could go on a very long rant about or uh, conversation about yokai. Um, again, that's not the subject of the day. Um, but um, yeah, so they're experiencing the same kinds of things. And so um, they they sort of sit, um, she pairs up with this yokai um, and they're going to kind of help each other out. Like she's going to, she's going to help this yokai who's become lost to return home. And the yokai is going to in return help Maple to sort of understand what her place is within, within medicine in this kind of new setting. Um, yeah. And so from there, I get to pretty much just do whatever I want in terms of um, referencing, referencing all of this incredibly rich folklore um, that, that sort of comes when you're exploring exploring something like as deep and um, as kind of that has such a history the way that yokai does um, and it's really so it's been really interesting for me to kind of build my own world but build it on I guess this um, sort of really deep um, this really deep folklore so I'm having a lot of fun and I do hope that it finds a home because I'd love to share more of it with people yes um, we've we we do have a thing from um, Hakuo who says that she that she misses uh or that they miss folk remedy so much and hope you're able to find a publisher soon <laughs> yes well they're one of my D D players so um thank you <laughs> <laughs> well us here too i really enjoyed reading it on webtoons and i feel excited to see it in its next format absolutely me as well thank you, thank you. and um and i feel as though this stream very easily could become just uh um yokai rants i wouldn't be opposed to that at all yeah. um but, but we do have some more questions coming through so um this is actually a bit more of a um a technical one and i guess um some of the things that you talked about in your earlier presentation might might key in here but this is from an anonymous viewer who asks how do you ensure your characters are consistent throughout your comics um, i.e. proportions and clothing and so on? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, this is definitely something that I struggle with. Um, so, I mean, a, a big part is just practice. Um, and actually, as you as you get used to drawing them, when you're drawing like 40 panels a week, you naturally will get more consistent with that over time um, because you just you get a, like, build up a muscle memory towards your characters. Um, but I think it's, it is always something to think about, I think, especially with, um, with sort of characters to make sure that you have, I guess, unique proportions for each of them. So as you can see, it's quite important to me that you can very easily tell my two main characters apart from each other. Maple has a lot of like circles and roundness to her, um, whereas Ember, um, they have a lot more angles and usually a lot more, um, sort of lithe or have, have more, um, yeah, um, a more kind of have a, like stronger, more graceful lines of action. So I guess all, you can also choose specific shapes that you associate with each character, which can help you to create that consistency. So I actually struggled to draw Maple a lot when I started because this hairstyle is like not the easiest to draw from all angles. And so that was something that I just needed to learn with practice was actually just to draw her from more angles and get the hang of it. Um, but now that I know her really well, I know that if I just make some rounder shapes, that that's going to give like a mapley effect to whatever it is that I'm drawing. Um, the same with Ember. Um, they have a lot more angles to them. So when I'm drawing their face, sometimes I might be like, oh, that's not quite, this doesn't quite feel like Ember. And I realize it's because I might have drawn them a little bit, um, a little bit too sort of roundy. And so I need to go back into my my principles that I've set up when I was designing the characters to make sure that they have those qualities to them. Um, so that's that's my tip. Um, and yeah, just practice in terms of the anatomy and stuff. Um, I really enjoy doing um, gesture drawing practice. Um, and there's a bunch of um, stuff that you can find either on YouTube of models that you can draw from that are specifically designed to be um, life drawing classes. I also use a website called um, Bodies in Motion, which is a paid subscription, but it's like amazing athletic people doing like um, crazy beautiful dances and stunts and like martial arts and stuff. So I learned an awful lot about anatomy from drawing from that. So um, if you can um, get to a gesture drawing class, um, really hurt, super, super recommend it for comics and animation in terms of getting a sense of movement and a sense of sort of proportion to your work. Um, but also otherwise just like get on YouTube. Um, you can also look up uh, like anatomy uh, for artists and stuff as well. 
um, and just sort of heaps of like um, playlists of content that you can learn and watch from there. So um, yeah, education is way more accessible than it used to be, which is awesome. Yeah, there seems to be, there's lots of resources online at the moment of tips and tricks for drawing web comics. Um, and Mikhail was just talking to us before about the importance of learning anatomy and how muscles work and what what parts of the body move and which direction and which don't. Yes, uh, I was really resistant to wanting to learn about that. <laughs> uh, don't be like me. It is actually really valuable. Um, and actually, if you if um, if like me, you're really interested in anime and manga, um, a lot of that stuff, those creators have an incredibly solid understanding of anatomy at the core found of their foundations that they're working from. So even if you're like, I want to abstract from this, it's easier to abstract and you'll get more fulfilling abstractions if you do actually do not like me and <laughs> focus on learning anatomy earlier. It's like eating vegetables. You have to do it to have a good, nutritious, artistic diet. Nice. Um, we've got another question here from, from another um, webcomic superstar, Rachel Smythe, whose book we have right here, Laura Limpers, says, how are you so amazing? <laughs> we agree. Because um, I have such a strong and lovingly supportive best friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, my... My proper question is, um, your comics pull from your identity as a mixed Japanese woman. How do you balance your cultural influence and making your stories relatable to a wider audience? Asks Hakuo. Um, so I feel like stories are a lot more human and a lot more relatable than we necessarily think. Um, I was really worried about this when I first started writing about my identity back in like so like 2014, 2015. Um, and I thought that it would be a really alienating experience. Um, and I wrote, I wrote some sort of short comics about, about um, my Japanese identity and what it meant for me um, and the kind of difficult way that I connected to it. And it turned out that was actually an extremely relatable experience, not just because, um, not just for other folks who were mixed Japanese like me, but anyone who came from more than one place. So whether that was that they were mixed with other, like from other um, cultures or they were like um, an immigrant or in, in any way f um, participated in more than one culture within their life. Um, and there was a lot of imposter syndrome and a lot of them, a lot of kind of, um, yeah, folks who just like, who felt really connected to me when I started to share my story. And so I was like, actually, like, this is, this is great. Like, this is, um, there is a community here that's like desperate to see themselves represented, whether it is other people from mixed Japanese heritage or just mixed kids in general, who really want to be able to um, see and experience a story that centers their kind of experience. And it's really different, I think, from, um, from what we might get from like a mainland Japan experience compared to what it is that you get when you engage with, um, with a diaspora, with a diaspora perspective. Like it's just always going to be really different. And I used to feel really self-conscious that I could never deliver a mainland Japan. And I was like, actually, I don't need to. Um, I can deliver my Japan or the things that are really important and resonate with me. And that's actually got its own special place and value. And I think that, like, as we're saying with, um, is that you don't actually need to be from a background to connect with it. Um, you don't actually need to have any, you don't need to be mixed to be able to, like, look at this experience of, um, of um, internal conflict um, that's, you know, within an external society. I think a lot of us experience stuff like that. I think this is a very common experience for, uh, for anyone of any kind of queer identity. I think it's a really common experience uh, for anyone who has felt, um, you know, who might be neurodivergent or have a different experiences around that. Um, or in, even people who um, might have different goals for themselves than the people within their lives might necessarily think that they should have for themselves. So I feel like it's actually the, a really common experience that I just happen to have a very specific lens across. And so I think that's something that I feel makes it a really, um, that makes it compelling to write to, is I'm not necessarily looking to make it relatable, but just by the essence of what people go through an experience in their lives there, there are overlaps 
And so it's like, I don't know, it's relatable both in the specificity and in the fact that there's this, this kind of general energy uh, around it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's just, it's true to how we all experience life, isn't it? You know, um, we, we recognize the sort of general trends and currents of things that are going on around us and sort of broad strokes, you know, um, what our personalities are, what our friends' personalities are, what our family's personalities are like. But the experiences that we have day to day are, are specific, you know, they're notorious for being so um and so it stands to reason exactly as you said that um that your specific experiences that you talk about will resonate with a wider audience um than those who have shared those experiences necessarily mm. it's yeah um <laughs> a slight slight divergence from this particular train of um train of thought but um we have another anonymous question come in um what are your favorite things to draw <laughs> things to draw um girls i guess i draw a lot of them. <laughs> um I, I which is really more that i i struggle to draw i struggle to draw men i love drawing i love drawing women i love fashion um and i i really like i guess it's not necessarily an individual thing to draw but i love i guess finding like a um i like i've found this brush that i'm really enjoying this is all like ink brush that i'm using now so i, I quite like establishing um establishing like a design sense and then working within that so um that's the kind of thing that i really like to like to um sort of develop like if i'm going to use this really strong brush line what else do i need to do to make sure that this can really um be as prominent within the design as i want it to be as well as making sure that it is um that it is like um you know not overbearing or overpowering and i'm not sort of over complicating myself my self or my um what it is that i'm um trying to do so um so yeah i i think you know I, it's um yeah i like i like finding that um that kind of design language almost and working within that i really love how you how you sort of came with that from the perspective of um like find a brush you like and then sort of what's what speaks to you from that that's such a such a cool way of conceiving of like the process of creation and it kind of um i guess keys into a question that actually one of the comic fest team um here had today which was um they're a massive massive fan of your work and they especially love um the kind of um, almost like japanese watercolor styles that you achieve um in a lot of your work like you can sort of see the texture of the paints and the backgrounds and all this kind of stuff i'm looking at this um publication we have here um sunshine um sitting right in front of us and um just the incredibly gorgeous brushwork in these backgrounds um it's yeah is 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 that sort of like watercolor style a, a really conscious inspiration for you like um or is it again just a case that you found a brush that you loved and it kind of informs that work? Um, so with folk remedy, it's a very conscious decision that I'm drawing on a lot of um, a lot of like woodblock um, printing, but especially on um, what's um, the shinhanga printing method, which is essentially taking the traditional like yukioya style printing method or print method that was used for that, but updating it with modern colors and modern kind of um, sort of like perspectives and. Um, and rendering techniques that had come over from the West during that time. Again, it's very much of the era of stuff that I'm interested in, this sort of early, um, this Taisho era, Japan, um, sort of pre, um, post Meiji era, which was the time where they like forcibly had their borders opened and had to be very quickly Westernized. Um, and then after a while they were like, actually, we still want to be Japanese. Um, and so this was a part of like, sort of working out what that meant before rearing off into imperialism. So this was a little window of, um, of sort of arts and culture that felt really special. Um, so yeah, so it's a very conscious decision because it's a conscious element of those things. Um, within Sunshine, I was still very much in a, um, in a, Sunshine was actually completely um, um, traditionally inked. And I was actually planning to paint it by hand, but I did not do my proper research into the tools that I was using before I started coloring it. And I used a water soluble ink pen. So that meant that I was then going forced to make some changes and decisions as to how it was that I was going to color it. And so I had to bring it into a digital environment. I actually hand scanned a lot of those textures in myself 
Um, so they were, I would did sort of like big ink washes and then scan those in, um, which I don't do now mainly because I'm lazy and other people do and you can buy them online. So a lot of the other sort of ink textures and stuff are things that I bring in that are from, from artists on like this brushes, um, I think from, from one of those sort of like big brush packs that you can buy. Um, and there's a lot of other beautiful ones that I have that are, um, that I've also sort of bought or attained online from other people, um, who have that kind of a sense. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've always kind of, I like having a little bit of texture within my work if I can. Um, I feel like it does give a little bit more, it's, it's just something that I enjoy within my own work. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it is, it is just a, a aesthetic thing that I enjoy. Um, yeah. And so I have a lo whole lot of brushes that, that will give me different versions of that, like literally like so many, so many brushes, so many brushes, um, so many, so many brushes um but you just yeah um and uh, i've got a bunch of the ones that were um kyle's brushes which you can get within photoshop um and then i've also got a bunch of others that i've bought from other various sources so um yes um find cool brushes play around find textures you like beyond um i'm just referring to a new audience question beyond the art styles that you're using what uh what other insp uh, what other what are some of your other biggest inspirations as a comic artist this is from Masubi in who's saying aloha from hawaii who is also a big fan of folk remedy oh aloha um i guess like i i'm really inspired by um by like other other mangaka and other other sort of artists online both sort of my contemporaries like my wonderful friend rachel um but also um also like um folks who have sort of come before me and uh, have done other work around um in, in uh, leading up to this so like i um you know really value like the work that um rumiko takahashi does so she writes like inuyasha <laughs> Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot to learn from, um, from engaging and reading that kind of stuff. My, uh, my current favorite is, um, Witch Hat Atelier, which if you haven't read, um, absolutely a thousand percent recommend is so beautiful. Um, and so I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot to love around, around those kinds of things. And then again, I'm just a hundred percent throwing myself into yokai, like yokai are amazing. They're so awesome. They're so fun. Um, there's, there are really interesting sort of cultural blend of, um, kind of quirky and silly. Like there's literally one, his name is Tofu Boy and he just walks around with a, with a piece of tofu asking you if you want some tofu. That's his whole deal as you're walking along the road at night. He's like, Hey, would you like some tofu? Nothing bad will happen to you if you accept or deny his tofu. He's just there very excited about his tofu. Um, Thank you perfect man didn't exist <laughs> <laughs> so yes um so um yeah i think finding finding something like um finding folklore has been sort of very uh, very fulfilling for me yeah yeah i kind of want to meet tofu boy now <laughs> oh i know um he's uh, he's pretty great i think by the sounds of it um, Sally from the stream asks, um, what, what are your favorite things about, about this format you're working in now, this kind of like a vertical scroll format? How does that sort of help you work? Oh, uh, so number one, it's really fast. So because you don't have to worry about paneling, um, into a, a page, you can actually just worry about each moment individually. Um, the other thing I really like about it is it's very accessible. So a comic page, you, I feel like you actually have to know a certain amount about comics to know how to read a comic page. Whereas with scroll format, you can pick up your phone, you can open a, an app that delivers you scroll format comics like Webtoon or Tuppers, and you can instantly know how to read it because it's just going to be the panel after panel. Um, it also gives you some really interesting things that you can do in terms of, um, in terms of pacing because you actually can like, there's a, there is a certain, there's a maximum that someone can scroll um, and you can actually take advantage of that by being aware of how big the phone is, which is where most people are going to be reading scroll format comics. 
um, especially with with apps like Webtoon, and you can actually control how much they can see and where their attention is at any one time. So it actually feels a lot more dynamic to tell a story within this format compared to a traditional comic format, which is not which is not time bound. So I find that with that can sometimes be difficult for initial readers to follow action, whereas you can actually very easily follow action within a webtoon because each moment is is segmented out to be impactful. Um, and then you can also have these really beautiful, um, you do have to work a little bit harder. I love, love, love a, a, um, in, pr- in traditional formatting, a double page spread. So this is like a really incredible experience of the change in pacing when yeah. you can turn over a page and you can experience like a whole moment um, that that takes up the space that um, that an entire conversation was taking up in previous and previous things, and that's a huge tool for um, for um, page artists to take advantage of in order to get those impactful moments. And you can do the same in print by having incredibly long panels that can then actually span that can either slow time down, and so you can just really dig into like a very large landscape. Or you can actually have time move through them. So I've I've done a panel before where it's like the panel is incredibly long, but the character is actually represented like five times through the panel. Because as you scroll, the first character is now not on the screen anymore and the second pair of characters is. So you are um, able to kind of play with people's sense of time in that way. Um, I've also seen some really interesting stuff done with perspective where people sort of go into the panel. So you have a very tall panel that then it's like the interesting thing that's happening feels like you're actually going looking through like a crowded marketplace and you're spotting the character that you need to like rush past and it's um that can be really interesting as well so I feel like it's a really engaging format um there's a lot of potential there and a lot of readers yeah and it feels like there's there's the more that people play with it there's more opportunities that come out that people get inspired by each other and learn from from what other one other people are doing we've got a question here from kate uh who asks what other authors and artists interpretations of their cultures inspire you that's a good question there's some excellent questions coming through oh my god um i guess that's that's um that's a really interesting one. I feel that it's um, I'm I'm kind of guilty of focusing a little bit too much on only Japanese stuff, which is like not necessarily um, yeah. There's there's much much wider world out there. Um, I I do um, I'm, and I'm always like other authors that puts me on the spot a lot. Um, there's a lot of interesting lists going around at the moment that are celebrating sort of like um, F, um, Asian Pacific um, I, um, Pacific and um, identity. Um, because it's um, it's AAPI month in um, in America, so I would say go and find someone who is more articulate than me around this stuff who's put a curated list together. Um, I'm sure they're Mikhail, Mikhail, Mikhail Mordecai, yeah, who was who was on the live stream just before you. His stories on Instagram at the moment. He's doing a lot sharing AAPI um, performers and creatives at the moment so that's yeah great. yes so go listen to Mikhail um you know he's great so <laughs> um we've got uh Gillian as well whose whole family is gathered around to watch today oh my God. thanks for watching Gillian um who asked did you do art as a subject at school and did that help uh so yes I did do art as a subject at school um whether or not it helped kind of depends I was driven to do this anyway so I think you could like if I had not done any art classes I would probably still be here today um I also had a potentially adversarial relationship with some of my artistic art teachers I think because I knew that I was driven towards I was always driven towards sequential storytelling and I was driven towards things like manga and anime and video games and comics and cartoons these are things that within a high school art classroom are not considered to be valuable things to, to be interested in. Um, and there is a, like, I'm, I, you know, I feel like um, there is a little bit of, um, of sort of orientalism or racism that is associated with saying that comic, that manga especially isn't like a valid form of art when it absolutely, absolutely is. 
So I clashed a lot with my teachers in terms of them not understanding what my artistic inspiration was and what my vision was for my work and want them wanting me to paint flowers. And I'm like, I'm never going to enjoy painting flowers. I'm just not. Um, and so, so that was always very, very frustrating for me, um, especially sort of in the sort of like um, year 11, year 12 kind of age group. Um, and the older, older groups, I kind of became more drawn towards graphic design as a, as a field of study rather than specifically uh, um, illustration, mainly because I have my own sense about what I want my drawings to look like. And I didn't trust any of the people around me to tell me or guide me in a way that I actually wanted to be guided. So going to graphic design meant that I didn't have to worry about that. And it meant that I could instead focus on what it is that I wanted to focus on, which was improving my sense of composition, um, getting more familiar with concepts like typography, getting more, com um, getting uh, like a, a skill I could also fall back on because I think anyone who works in comics knows it doesn't necessarily pay the bills. Um, and so, um, so all of that I found has actually made me a better comic artist because I had the better understanding of those principles. And obviously fashion design seems to play a big part as well in every comic actually that I've ever seen that you do. Your, the style that your characters have is very evocative and becomes part of the, the signaling that you do for what this character is about. Yeah, I, um, I, I feel that character design, which includes cost, it's very much what they're wearing as a part of that. And so what it is that you dress your characters in will tell you an awful lot about who they are and what you can expect from them. If you've got a character who's in a very, um, an outfit that takes up a lot of space, so it's got, you know, a lot of like flares or, um, or is puffy, you can probably sense that that character is going to be one that um, is maybe a little bit more outgoing. If you have a character that's got, um, you know, longer sleeves and is more conservatively dressed, you might also match the mannerisms within that, that then you can tell that that character just by looking at them is going to potentially be a little bit more reserved than another kind. So I feel that um, learning about like shape, shape and silhouette can also give you so much of a sense of like, it can help you to very easily recognize your characters. So even if you've got a bunch, they're like all pop stars or something, they've all got a very similar kind of an energy about them. You can still make them distinctive and make them recognizable because of the shapes that you choose to represent them. It's like what I'm saying with like Maple gets round shapes so I can make sure that when I'm drawing her, she feels round. So she gets, she gets like, um, you know, sleeves that, that sort of billow in a specific way that adds to that feeling. Whereas Ember, who is like much, like much less that, um, they, they, you know, they, they have their, they have their arms out. They're like, have more of a, um, so that I can show off more of the kinds of movement that I want to design with that. Um, so yeah, very conscious decision. I noticed as well that as you've been colouring in Maple, you bring up swatches and a kind of palette every now and again. Is that something that you have these different palettes for different characters? Yes. So um, like this is Maple's palette here. So these are all Maple's different colours. Um, then the, this is like eyeball, um, inside of mouth or tongue, and um, then blush. Everyone has the same blushy. I should probably give them different colored blushies, but these are that's what this one is. Um, yeah, and then these ones are embers colors here. Um, this is peach, and then these ones are like um, sort of emphasis moments. So if I'm doing like a special effect or something, I will use these ones. Um, yeah, and then yeah, there's a couple of other characters in here as well. So I find this is a really good way when I'm working on um, on a long format comic to have these as the base. Um, and then if I actually wanted to say that this was actually a night scene and I wanted it to be like a nighttime, nighttime colors, um, so like this, um, then I can actually very easily um, put maple in nighttime colors by, um, by clipping like a, the same color to her but then just reducing the opacity and so now she looks like she's she matches the rest of the environment um and then i can actually like um you know if there's a if there's a light source um i can also add that over the top as well to like clip into it so you can very quickly by having by having these all set out 
um, you can very quickly sort of um, shape into that. All right, the background is the character layer, so um, so you can very quickly. And this is again the the um, my favorite fill tool. I actually do most of my most of my shape shaping, uh, most of my shading and shaping using this tool. Um, and it saves my hand so much, so much, not having to color these shapes in individually. But then yeah. I can always come back in and like shape, shape it out. So if I wanted to make sure that it had like that textured edge. So it's not so having to do one brush stroke instead of like 15. Incredible. Hey, we've, uh, it's gone really fast, but we've come to the end of our time. I'm so sorry, but thank you for your um, incredible work and the generosity of your presentation. Like, my mind is blown right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. You're, you're so incredibly talented and your setup is amazing and it's just been wonderful to chat with you and to hear about your tips and tricks and I'm sure that um, all of our listeners will agree. And thank you so much for coming along today and you will be back this afternoon as well for yes our panel discussion which is at 1 30 and then you'll be popping in for the live q a at around 2 20. so yes. viewers can tune back in there but actually keep tuning in for the whole day because we're here from nine to five and thank you so much for joining us gem we really thanks. appreciate it thanks sam sorry for talking so long but um oh, yeah, we love it. <laughs> yeah thank, thank you so much, much. We could have an eight hour just gem fest day. Exactly. This could be the gem you're show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Wonderful. See you, Jim. Bye. Bye.